C-spine trauma. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the transverse ligament, where it is located, and what is the function of the transverse ligament. It provides the C1, C2 stability. You can see it is behind the odontoid, and it anchor the odontoid to the ring of C1. So it prevent an abnormal movement between C1 and C2 because the spinal cord is behind the odontoid, behind C2. ADI in adult is 3.5 millimeter. So if that ligament is injured, C1 and C2 will be free to move and you'll have an increase of the ADI. Isolated traumatic injury of the transverse ligament is probably rare. But let's take a condition where the transverse ligament injury can be a problem. This Jefferson fracture, C1 or Atlas fracture. It's an axial load. C1 is a ring. C1 and C2 control 50% of rotation of the neck. So you can have a bony fracture, which is fracture of part of the ring or multiple fractures in the ring. Usually that is a stable injury and you can have the fracture in addition to disruption of the transverse ligament. Do an open mouth view, open mouth x-ray, and you find the lateral mass overhang is less than 6.9, then that fracture is stable and the treatment is usually non-operative treatment. But if the lateral mass overhang more than 6.9, then there is disruption of the transverse ligament. You will see that overhang in the open mouth x-rays. But if you look at the lateral view, and the ADI is more than 3.5, then there is an injury to the transverse ligament. And if it is more than 5, then there is an injury to the apical and the alar ligament, in addition to the transverse ligament. CT scan really is the treatment of choice because this fracture can be missed due to inadequate X-rays of the occipital cervical junction. Also, this fracture is associated with other fractures, so the CT scan will help us in finding other fractures. This fracture opens the canal, so the risk of neurological deficit is not that high. You got to decide if that fracture has transverse ligament disruption or not. You can treat it by a hard cervical orthosis or by a halo. Never a halo in the elderly. I think halo will be good for transverse ligament avulsion fractures when you see bony avulsion on the CT scan. Use a halo to observe the patient. If you don't want to do C1 and C2 fusion. However, if there is injury to the transverse ligament, you will do C1, C2 fusion because that injury is unstable. Just remember, geriatric patients with a spinal cord injury or upper C spine fractures will have an increased mortality, and the halo is contraindicated in the geriatric population. When you put a halo, watch out the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve root injury. Another one is odontoid fracture. Type 1 is an avulsion of the tip. You will give the patient orthosis. Type 2, the odontoid process itself. 
the non-union rate is high, up to 80%, especially if you have more than 5 mm of displacement or the patient is older than 50 years. Other risk factors are delay in treatment, posterior displacement of the fracture, and diabetes. Do not use halo in the elderly. They will die from pneumonia. How do you treat tattoo fracture in a young patient? You will treat it by a halo. If it is displaced and there are risk factors for non-union, then you will do surgery. What kind of surgery? You will do odontoid screw in young patient. Why odontoid screw? Because you want to preserve C1 and C2 motion because it controls 50% of the rotation. You don't want to use that in somebody young. If somebody is older, then you can use C1 and C2 fusion. So how do you treat type 2 if the patient is old? Orthosis or you do surgery for a fusion of C1 and C2 if there is an indication for surgery and if there is a clearance for surgery. How about type 3 fracture where it goes into the body? You treat it by rigid orthosis or halo. Hangman fracture. It's a fracture that involves the pedicles of C2, so the spinal canal is wider and there will be low risk for spinal cord injury. There are several types. One of them is the non-displaced, which is type 1. The fracture is vertical and no angulation and no translation, and you treat that by cervical orthosis. Type 2, there's some angulation and translation, so you will treat it by traction and extension and put the patient in a halo for about three months. There's another type that's bad, type 2A, which will have severe angulation with little translation because the ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament is disrupted. You cannot treat that by traction because you will pull the spinal cord apart. So you will treat it by extension and halo in compression for about 6 to 12 weeks, and you may need to fuse that. And type 3, this is a surgical type. This is a fracture of the pericles in addition to facet dislocation. It has some neurological deficit association and the treatment is surgery, open reduction and posterior spine fusion. How about facet dislocations? The association of herniated disc and facet involvement is very high. So watch out that you don't have a herniated disc in addition to the bony injury. That's double trouble. So when you have a unilateral facet dislocation, usually there is less than 50% translation on x-rays. And it may affect a nerve root. If you have bilateral facet dislocation, there will be more than 50% translation and probably a spinal cord injury. Ligaments injury don't heal, so it needs to be fused. It needs surgery. So the treatment of facet dislocation is immediate close reduction, then get the MRI, then do the surgery. But if the patient has a mental status change, then you will do the MRI first and immediately, followed by open reduction and surgical fixation. When do you go anteriorly? We will go anteriorly if there is a disc herniation, the incidence is about 10 to 30% in cervical facet dislocation. So if you try to do reduction, the disc fragment may stay in the canal 
causing a spinal cord injury. So when do you go posteriorly? If reduction of the dislocation failed and there was no disc herniation. When do you do combined anteriorly and posteriorly? We got to go anteriorly to remove a disc and we got to go posteriorly because the dislocation cannot be reduced by a closed method or by an open anterior technique. Three important points for facet dislocations. Number one, get the MRI before surgery. Make sure you don't have a disc herniation. Number two, ligaments injury don't heal. It needs fusion. It will need surgery. Number three, know the arrangement of the facet, the superior facet and inferior facet. In a normal and in subluxed or dislocated facets, because they will confuse you, especially in the exam. Know the naked facet or the empty facet. Train yourself to see that because you will have an arrow at one of them and they ask you which facet is this. The superior, the inferior, is it the level above or the level below? So what is a naked facet? It is the CT appearance of an uncovered vertebral articular facet when the facet joint is dislocated. It usually indicate flexion, distraction, injury with severe ligamentous disruption and spinal instability. Now we need to talk about the MRI. If the patient is awake, you will do close reduction before you get the MRI. Because if something bad happened, like deterioration of the neurological status, we will know about it by conversing with the alert awake patient. And then you can release the traction if it happened. So you reduce the spine and then you get the MRI. In what situation you get the MRI first before you do a close reduction? If the patient is not alert, not awake, drunk, not cooperating, or if you can do that close reduction, then before you take the patient to surgery, you need to get the MRI. You need to see the second trouble. So now we got the MRI after the close reduction or before the close reduction. Then we're going to take the patient to surgery. If while you're doing close reduction and the patient is alert, awake, cooperative, then you get neurological deficit, then you need to relax the reduction, get an MRI, and you're going to go to surgery. Then you can have the facet fracture, usually the superior facet. This facet injuries usually occur from flexion, distraction, force plus minus rotation. Another entity is the ligamentous injury of the spine, which you will demonstrate by an MRI or by flexion extension views, will show you translation more than 3.5 or angulation more than 11 degree, then you will need to do surgery. Then you have the burst fracture of the lower C spine, from axial compression, usually they have neurological deficit and the treatment is usually anterior decompression and fusion. Unless you have posterior ligamentous injury, then you will fix that also. Then the extension injuries that can happen in the elderly will give you central cord syndrome. Then you have the tear drop fracture the teardrop fracture is the most severe unstable fracture of the C-spine. It usually occurs from flexion and compression, which is different from the extension teardrop fracture, which usually occurs at C2, which is usually a stable injury. Both fracture types involve the anterior inferior aspect of the vertebral body.
Deflection type injury is usually associated with a spinal cord injury. The posterior part of the vertebral body will be displaced into the spinal canal. The posterior ligaments will be disrupted and will allow separation of the spinous processes. The flexion type fracture is usually unstable and it will need surgery. Then you have the occipital cervical dislocation, which is a fatal injury, but rare, and usually treated by occipital cervical fusion. Occipital condyle fracture It is a rare injury. It's usually incidental finding seen on a head CT scan. One third of occipital condylar fracture occurs with atlanto occipital dislocation. Treatment occipital cervical fusion based on flexion extension x rays. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.